Well, the first flaw in educating genteel folks today is to get them ready to make a living. This comes before almost anything. If grandmother was in college today, she would probably uh, be either taking secretarial work, bookkeeping, she might be doing specialty in librarian work, or she might be preparing to be a school teacher. These are the types of things we are more concerned with now. Well, probably we have to be. There's no sense in denying the fact that the economic problem presses in upon gentility just as much as upon any other level of our society. But out of it all, we have lost something that I think we should reconsider. It's no longer possible to build some of these values into our education at a formal period of training, but we can build those things which have been discarded or overlooked into our mature life by intent and purpose. Now, the uh, gentility of grandmother could be paralleled a little bit by the gentility of grandfather, for it was quite obvious that uh, a man uh, belonging to that period, expecting to live in a home under such conditions, must also have a certain amount of gentility of his own. So while he was in business, business rested rather lightly on his shoulders. Uh, he had the dignity for business, if not the aptitude. He did fairly well, and uh, everyone was uh, reasonably happy about the whole thing. He was able to accomplish that which was considered essential in his time, namely that all his children were enabled to have two years of musical education in Europe. This constituted a well-balanced life. This is the way people thought things through. For his own creativity, uh, Grandfather went into religion very heavily and became an outstanding authority in his day on St. Paul. Now, at the time when he was running a fairly successful business, he was also devoting a great deal of time to the study of Greek and Latin and the efforts to interpret early biblical history, which was very close to his interest. This type of family is becoming more and more rare. And we may say that uh, life with father, as Clarence Day called it, had also its drawbacks. It certainly did. But we did not have nearly the amount of stress and strain in our relationships at that time uh, that we have now. And uh, while people could have difficult temperaments, and there were certainly many uh, tyrannical families, at the same time, most people had some creative outlet. And that is the point we are particularly interested in trying to stress. That in our gradual acceptance of what we might term pressure civilization, we have come gradually to neglect those things uh, which could not immediately be fitted into the survival pattern. Life has become very largely a matter of devoting our energies to those things which we regard as necessary to success. And our definition of success is practically economic advancement. Thus we become a very lonely people. And the more successful we become, the more lonely we have to be. We are apt to be. Instead of success giving us an opportunity to do the things that in our hearts we want to do, Success finds us with nothing in our hearts that we want to do. This takes a great deal of the edge off of success. Uh, I talked to a rather successful man not long ago, as we call it today, and he said, I have everything that I want, but I, there's nothing that I really want. There is nothing important standing out to justify the tremendous struggle that we have made to accumulate certain things in this world. Instead of building toward a purpose, we make the actual accumulation the purpose itself. Instead of our various labors being means to some end that we desire, the very processes become ends in themselves. And as a result, uh, we find that the more successful we become, the less interesting we really are. Now, I don't know that too many of us are desperately concerned over trying to moderate success. I don't think that the average person is so successful that this is bothering him. But it is true that all the way along, even in the most uh, moderate situations, 
there seems to be a lack of overtones, and life is largely composed of overtones. As these fade out, we begin to get more and more of the starkness with which we face daily living today. Everything is so realistic, everything is so practical and inevitable that the individual not only has very little to interest him, but almost nothing to think about. That is, anything worthwhile. In the old days, we got a great deal of creativeness out of labor. Most uh, men, particularly, found their self-expression in their work. And this self-expression was perhaps humble, but very dramatic in itself. Uh, in the old days, when a man went out, got land, began to cultivate his property, he had a very big job on his hands. He was building a way of life in the wilderness. He had to make nearly everything that he needed himself. Maybe once or twice a year he sent into one of these uh, great sales companies that sent their catalogs out, and he ordered what he needed for the year. But for the most part, he had to devise ways. He had to find ways to bring water to his land. He had to find ways to get rid of the rocks and boulders that interfered with the harvest. He had to find ways to build his own house. These were things that people did. And as a result of that, they had a certain ingenuity continually operating. The same was true in the older days of our small cottage industry. In the small town, the shoemaker was a man of ingenuity. He had all kinds of problems. He had not only to repair shoes, but to make them. He had the right, like the guild masters of Nuremberg, to take a great pride in the things that he did. The same was true in the building uh, crafts and trades. These things represented continually individual problems. Today, these problems are largely forgotten, and more and more, the whole problem of maintenance is replacement. Don't fix anything, just throw it out and get another one. There is no longer any ingenuity, no effort to economize, no effort to preserve good products. As a result, almost all of the arts and trades have lost their creative value to the individual. They no longer challenge it. They are no, he is no longer challenged by the time clock. He becomes part of some large industry. Someone else does all his thinking for him. Any individuality is apt to be penalized. Even in matters of religion, we find this continual pressure of conformities. It's not very interesting even anymore to be a really uh, a heterodox thinker. The individual simply finds little opportunity for the development of his own creativity even in religion. Reading has largely disappeared from our people, uh, except for a small group of really serious thinkers. For the rest, reading has become too difficult. It is too arduous, especially when you've never been taught how to spell. As a result of that, you turn to picture publications, because anybody can spell a picture. Now, in the old days, the picture way of reading was set forth in beautiful form in McGuffey's Reader. And in McGuffey's Reader, you learned that when you were about six or seven years old, it was better to use pictures uh, for ideas than it was words. And gradually, you learned the words that were associated with the picture. Today, for some reason, that which was fashionable for the kindergarten and the first two grades of grammar school now becomes the mature method of securing an education. In other words, we look at world events. We don't read about them. We look at what is happening. And the most successful publications we have today have a minimum of text and a maximum of pictures. We are finding this more and more in technical books. In my own field of interest, for example, uh, we hear that there's a new publication coming out on some advanced theme. We'll take, for example, symbolism, which to me is a very interesting subject. So we look the book over, and what do we find? We have 212 pages of pictures and 8 pages of text. And anything that you want isn't in the text. And the more you read it, you more, the more you realize that you only have 8 pages of text because the author didn't know what he was talking about and was able to generalize to the extremity of his knowledge in 8 pages. This situation, again, denies us certain activity. Uh, we, do not, uh, we do not have the experience of the kind of thoughtfulness that we once found so intriguing. 
Many is the long winter evening with an uh, old-fashioned kerosene lamp that the great classics of the world were read by thoughtful people. This is too much work now. We, uh, we're interested in the digest version. The more digested, the better. If it is entirely digested and nothing is left, then this we will pay for, because we simply do not want the kind of work that is implied. In uh, almost every field of our artistic expression, we've become listeners. Uh, we no longer really make any desperate effort uh, to create something. When our friends who are interested in music come in for the evening, we turn on the hi-fi or produce some equipment that costs several thousand dollars, and everyone has an enchanting evening. Now, this has its advantages, certainly. For the first time, perhaps, great music comes into the home of the average person. But with all of this, we have developed nothing but ears. We have developed no actual sense of participation. We do not create. We simply absorb that which is created by others. This lack of the personal involvement in creativity takes everything out of fact and into theory. Uh, philosophy and religion both have emphasized from the beginning that the only way in which man can grow is by experience. Well, of course, listening is an experience. There's no question about that. But listening is a different kind of experience from participating. Listening is not the full experience or the full joy or the full satisfaction that comes to the individual who releases something from inside himself. The whole theory of philosophy is based upon release. It is based upon the individual moving from his own internal out into a world of personal self-expression. This road that leads from the internal out is a broad highway. It is a road along which many basic ideas have to travel. It is the road in which, uh, along which consciousness moves into manifestation. It is the road in which inner growth is made possible, a road by which all theory is tested by application, and that which is not able to sustain itself in application is allowed to rest for the moment and not dominate our way of life. All around us we observe a world of untested theories, a world in which even those theories that are tested are not thought through. The power to think things through to their reasonable ends, uh, this power has been neglected. It's the turn of the century, if in the last 50 years, scientifically trained persons who developed high exactitudes of method had also had the power to think things through they would undoubtedly have been more cautious in launching upon the world forms of knowledge which could be so easily perverted and could so easily lead to the general destruction of human security. But with their minds totally upon one idea, with no perspective, with no sense of the unfolding pattern of things, uh, these individuals went along like moles underground, working in darkness and totally unaware that what we do must have consequences and that we must ultimately live with these consequences. And any uh, way of life which does not recognize this is immature. And any uh, system of education which does not teach it is inadequate. Yet we have gone on our way and from the examples of the leaders of our way of life, the average person has been over-influenced until today uh, we simply have lost the knack of thinking things through to their consequences and planning our own living accordingly. We have lost this creative skill. Now it is true that perhaps in many areas of activity, creativity does not seem to be terribly important. It wouldn't seem to be very essential to the individual that finding a piece of equipment broken down, and perhaps being unable to get replacement, 
he begins to think in terms of repairing this thing himself. This will require some thoughtfulness. It will require some skill also. Perhaps he may have to do what his ancestor did, uh, file and cut an entirely new part out of a piece of base metal. But this type of ingenuity is constantly calling upon resource. It is causing the individual to move something out from within himself. It causes him to be a little better disciplined. If he doesn't make this replacement properly, it won't fit. The haphazard, inadequate type of work, uh, which we have developed in recent years, is simply part of this pattern of the person not moving adequately from his own resources. There is no doubt in the world that we are all a resourceful people, but we are neglecting this to a very sad degree. As we lose the idea, the basic concept of moving from within ourselves, our spiritual and philosophical values are also slighted. Today the world is filled with groups of people following somebody. Uh, these groups of people do not really know where they are going, most of them. They do not know the real value of the thing they are following. But it is easier to follow and accept than it is to think. And as a result, many very unfortunate situations arise in which uh, persons become involved in ideas which are not practical, which are not useful, and have no virtue perhaps except a little immediate glamour. But uh, not thinking, not being able to experience through things, we are gullible. And the more gullible we are, the more we will suffer, the more we will hurt ourselves and perhaps injure others in the same procedure. So we like to feel very definitely that creativity is important, that creativity gives us the habit of solving problems, that creativity gives us the habit of self-expression. We can say that perhaps self-expression is possible without creativity. It is. But then there is always the danger that such types of self-expression will lead to destructivity instead of creativity. The individual has no pattern behind his action, has really no way of contributing a positive value to anything. So it is not just enough to do something. This something must have meaning. It must be under some censorship and some discrimination. And day by day, these powers weaken in us until we become very largely victims of the pressures of conformity and thoughtlessness. So in our field of interest, certainly, the reward goes to the person who is able to do something and do it well. To do something with a philosophy of life means to discriminate. We are all surrounded by ideas, some of them good, some of them bad. There are ideas that work for other people but not for us. And somewhere along the line we have to get over this idea that everyone is so much alike that patterns can be imposed upon individuals and that almost anyone can successfully follow the same pattern. In the area of medicine, we know this is not true. We know that unless the individual uh, is understood, unless various tests are made, it is not safe to medicate him. Uh, he may not react as his neighbor does. And this idea of exchanging recipes over the back fence may or may not produce anything very constructive. But we know that the human being is an individual. And to the degree that we impose upon this individual complete conformity, we destroy in him self-expression, and we gradually destroy in him the incentive to be a person. Most of our neurotics are people who have lost this incentive or never had it. And creativity is the greatest solution uh, to the negative attitudes of people. Creativity is the one answer to self boredom. It is a very powerful answer to self-pity. It is a wonderful panacea for worry. 
and uh, worry and boredom and self-pity are the common ailments of our time. We may add to this group another, fear. Fear is, of course, something always difficult to work with. But fear grows and enlarges where we have no adequate internal mental emotional life. Busy people have very little time to be afraid. But you cannot be so busy doing unimportant things that you can overcome the neurotic tendencies merely by activity, unless this activity is meaningful. Meaningful activity must be that which is supported by the psychic content in ourselves. We term enjoyment uh, the problem or the process of appreciating and gaining pleasure from what we do. According to the level of our own insight, this pleasure standard changes. We are not necessarily pleasure seekers in the same way that Aristippus was. We are not looking for pleasure merely as gratification of sensory perception or sensory appetites. But pleasure must come from some internal motion or quality by which we gain satisfaction from what we do. And this kind of pleasure encourages us to greater and greater personal activity. We look around among people, particularly those who seem to have more than their share of problems, and we find that for the most part they are persons whose personal creativity is inadequate. They may be busy people, they may be well-intentioned people, but they have never made a conscious link with their own subjective life. As a result, when they become quiet, when they try to relax, there is no constructive mental activity to take over and to make sure that these people enjoy self-expression. You give persons in these problems opportunities uh, to express themselves, and they are largely bewildered. Today, the individual on his own is bewildered. He will immediately take refuge in some collective. He is afraid to attempt the quiet, secure effort at self-expression. Or he becomes belligerent, affirming that to express himself means merely to differ with things as they are. So we have a vast body of complainers. It's per perfectly right for an individual to recognize the weaknesses of a society around him. I can understand why he is not overly happy at some of the candidates for public office. It's quite understandable that he is not satisfied with the policy policies of his employers. It's also quite true that he may be dissatisfied with the education and religion of his time. That there are real reasons for dissatisfaction, we know. But dissatisfaction, per se, is no solution to a problem. There are reasons why we should be dissatisfied, but there are even greater and more pressing reasons why we should use our ob observation to lead to some constructive action of our own. It's quite true that our dissatisfaction, unless it becomes a mass movement, may have very little political significance. But it is also true that dissatisfaction must lead us to a constructive effort to correct in our own lives that with which we are dissatisfied. There's simply no use of complaining. Complaining as such is now regarded more or less as a status symbol. If we are dissatisfied, we are intellectuals, because it is essential that all intellectual people be thinkers. And the first and only formula for thinking that we know at the moment is, gentlemen, I disagree. This is a sign that we really have done some heavy work. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't mean anything. Dissatisfaction, however, brings a certain social, psychic contact. We immediately move into a group with similar dissatisfactions and incorporate. Then we have an opportunity to spend a certain number of hours daily or weekly or monthly from that time on dissatisfying with other people. We can go on and on and on with this procedure, but we haven't accomplished anything. 
the moment the individual observes that something is wrong, the question is, to what degree is he cooperating with this thing that is wrong? To what degree is he under the same hypnosis? To what degree is he using complaint as an evasion in, in the place of action? In our matters of complaining, presuming that we have legitimate complaint, presuming, for example, that we disagree with a certain legislation, uh, we assume at the moment that our big answer is to vote against it. But what have we in the form of self-creative solution to this problem? It may be that we will never have an opportunity to apply any solution that we may have. But an individual complaining should always have a constructive uh, answer in his own consciousness for that against which he complains. A complaint should be a stimulation to intellectual effort and not merely uh, a continual habitual dissatisfaction. If an individual says, I think this is wrong, we have a right to ask him, then what do you think is right? And we should get a straight answer. And that's why we never get it. Very often we will get an answer, uh, probably uh, which arises in a moment of desperation. It was never thought of until we asked the question. But then in order to defend self against the humiliating uh, fact of being required to say, I don't know, we begin to come up with something. And very often the solution we have is worse than the problem we attack. Actually, our own solution, if applied to the problem, would be meaningless. Consequently, we haven't thought it through. And this is one of the great matters of, of existence. Why do we live here? Why have we been taken out of some, uh, at least theologically defined, paradisical abode, uh, which we... Uh, uh, were cast out of because of an unhappy addiction to apples. In this, um, in this situation, why are we here? Are we really here to be dissatisfied? Are we here to be complacent? Are we here to ignore the whole problem and make a few dollars? If there is any reason to be here, it would seem to me that it is, we are here to learn something. We do not learn by accepting or rejecting. We do not uh, learn by ignoring. We do not learn by collapsing in a sense of total helplessness. If there's something here that we need to know, the only way to find out is to use the powers that we have to reason through a situation and find the answer. Now, occasionally we do this, but not as often as we should. And we divide the problem of answer into two very broad areas. Cross-sections by polling of the American people and reports based upon letters which are received by the White House and other centers of government would indicate that from the people have come and are still flowing many important ideas. It may not be entirely fair to say that all of these ideas are ignored. It is also perhaps not quite fair to say that all of these ideas, coming from persons unacquainted usually with the specifics of the problem, can be immediately applied. But there has been an observable fact, namely that thousands of people have had good ideas about how things could be improved. They are, however, a very small minority of the population. But this fact does stand out, that where the person is perhaps only indirectly involved, where the consequences of a policy will not be felt on his own skin, the person does have better ideas. He is less personal. He has no immediate benefit to himself to consider. He is not going to be instantly involved in an argument over his idea. 
So he writes it in or telegraphs it in. And because it comes from a certain impersonality within himself, it is often very constructive. But when he has an idea about himself, about his own family, about the environment in which he lives, about the management of personal affairs, it is much harder for him to have a constructive idea. This is because he must fight through this tremendous complex of his own personal opinions and attitudes. Against his ideas will be arraigned all of his prejudices, all of his opinions and conceits, his traditional pressures, and a large amount of mental and emotional fatigue. All this centers on his effort to solve his own problem. So we give excellent advice to strangers and keep none of it ourselves. We know that everyone else should live together in brotherly love, but we can't get along with anybody. We know that religion is a wonderful thing for other people, and that if they would live it better, we would be happier. What we're going to do about it is still very dim. Consequently, uh, we must work more carefully and more thoughtfully in the effort to get creativity out of our own subconscious and into our own personal conscious behavior. And we have to start some way. It is not reasonable to hope that we can probe inside of ourselves and bring out immediately a Plato or an Aristotle. We have to work with this internal allotment, bringing it into manifestation and exercising it gradually until it is strong enough uh, to carry major decisions. But we cannot get anywhere by simply ignoring it. We can accomplish nothing by going along, refusing and rejecting every impulse which might lead us to the investigation of our own inner life. Today, the inner life of man is being forced upon us by outward circumstances. The only area in which man can hope for integration is in himself. The only place where he's ever going to find constructive answers which can sustain him in time of trouble will be in his own nature. Institutions and organizations can contribute something, but the most that they can contribute is a greater incentive to continue this personal investigation of self for the purpose of discovering just how much strength there is in there. We know there's plenty of weakness on the outside, and the remedy that we recommend for this is to test the strength on the inside. Most persons who have made a, a sincere and honest test of this strength have been pleasantly surprised. They have discovered that the human being does possess within himself an almost inexhaustible reservoir of potential power. The individual is capable of solving his own problem. He is able to solve it in the only way that justice can be found in nature. If the solution to all human problems rested with collectives or rested with isolated individuals in places of authority, there could be no honesty in the universe. There could be no justice if an individual's personal destiny is not in some way immediately under his own control. If he is the victim of others, if he is the victim of the generation in which he lives, if he is the victim of the collective fear of his time, then there can be no essential merit system in space. It would appear that we are in this world, as many of the great philosophers have pointed out, to gradually discover that the world around us is merely an agent to stimulate in us the consideration of the world within us. That the world around us only controls us to the degree that we do not control ourselves. If we wish to drift, the world is a large area of potential drifting. If we wish to trust our courses entirely to the currents of existence, we will be battered around like a ship without a rudder. If we wish to insist and affirm 
that the tides will in their own good time take us where we are supposed to go, then in many instances we discover that our proper destiny is on the rocks. This we cannot permit to dominate our thinking. Actually, uh, we, our kind of living is divided into two basic brackets. The individual who is a victim of life and the individual who is a victor over life. There can only be two uh, such patterns. Either the person is continually troubled by the circumstances around him or he is constantly sustained by the resources within him. I think everyone would prefer to be sustained. But the trouble lies that in Western way of life we have done nothing to prepare the background uh, for the cultivation of the self-sustaining man. Nearly always there is a certain original relationship between a philosophy of life and an individual. No one can achieve tranquility of spirit for us, but there are ways in which the questing can be made easier. There is no way in which an individual can be assured that he will grow to virtuous maturity, but there are probabilities that he has a better chance of becoming a virtuous adult if he has had certain amount of conditioning in childhood. His probabilities of being an honorable citizen are increased if he comes out of an honorable home where he had proper affection, consideration, and thought, also discipline. If, therefore, the individual of today, the mature person, is seeking for a certain background for orientation, he is not so different from the person who is able to look back upon a childhood in which certain principles were clearly fixed. Today man looks back upon the childhood of Western civilization, and he does not find its principles clear or well fixed. He looks to the world around him to determine what people believe is right, and he finds very little that is clearly directed. He looks for resources within himself which have been trained by his opportunities and which would naturally be available, and he finds these resources inadequate. He has not the cooperation of his culture in anything that he needs to accomplish. Instead of being able to move within a pattern of acceptances, he is apparently required to move totally alone. Now, nature undoubtedly has set this pattern for a reason. Actually, the person who must move of himself and cannot depend upon co cooperative circumstances stands in the position of making the greatest personal achievement to the degree that he is forced to make a greater effort. To the same degree, he achieves a greater end. But uh, this is not always easy or optimistic. So not having very much cultural uh, stimulation, he is, the Western man is in a bit of a dilemma. 300 years, 400 years ago in China, if you wanted to be a gentleman, you became a poet. If you wanted to be considered a great citizen, you became a philosopher. And if you wished to be the highest type of desirable person, you became a mystic. These were the great honored levels. Today in our Western way of life, if you want to be acceptable on the best intellectual levels, you must believe in nothing. Now, of course, this should apparently lead to vast acceptability, but it doesn't even do that. Even on the proper basis of our way of life, we are not accepted for our unbelief any more than we would be for our believing. The reason why is there is no standard. There is nothing that is regarded as admirable. The only standard is a standard of success on a material level. And this standard is too brittle, too immature, to have any very constructive suggestions to make relating to the personal culture of the individual. Therefore, we do not have uh, the cultural pattern which might cause our young people to say, 
that I would like to be a really fine person, and that means that I have to be a thoughtful, constructive, idealistic citizen. This is not the incentive pattern under which we live. Lacking this incentive pattern, therefore, we are not only left without the incentive, but we are also left without the pattern. We are left with the average person unable to, to determine for himself what he should do. He cannot find enough evidence in contemporary situations as to how he can live a constructive, successful life. We still do have available to us the great religious systems of the past and the great idealistic philosophical systems. But the average person today is not equipped to make the transposition of time that is necessary. We are unable to take a, a religion like Christianity and simply apply it wholeheartedly to the 20th century. We are unable to break through medieval tradition and we try to impose it upon the modern world. In attempting to correct this, we ultimately become so confused that we are unable to use the religious factor consist, uh, constructively. Little by little, we see that uh, several hundred years of declining ideality, several hundred years of drifting away from ethical and cultural foundations has, uh, have resulted in a sort of derelict state. We have no clear insight as to how to start a constructive pattern of self-expression. We can't, we can't borrow from available uh, resources, nor can we simply go to school somewhere and learn it. It's a problem where each person has to think it through for himself. This is again more difficult than in ancient times, because remember 2,000 years ago, 5% of the population uh, alone was capable of involvement in the mature problems of life as we know them today. For the rest, life had to remain an exceedingly simple problem. Some of this simplicity was extremely good. Some of it, however, was, uh, was inadequate. But with a small group of people, also mostly trained in homo homogeneous culture, philosophy and religion had a far greater opportunity of exercising influence than they have today. Today, the average person is too well educated, has too much uh, contact with diversified cultural factors to be able to quickly differentiate that which he immediately needs. This becomes a further matter of confusion. Also, uh, the problems which we face are more complicated than those which were faced a thousand or two thousand years ago. Our own value senses changed in this period of time and we require a different kind of solution from our ancestor. But we have not clarified what kind of solution we mean. So assuming that we have reached the age in which solution becomes necessary and we cannot immediately turn to any available source for this solution, we have to begin to work through various plans and devices of our own in an effort to discover that which will most rapidly advance our own maturity will most uh, rapidly assist us to overcome the negative factors of our own temperaments and bring our own personality onto an even keel. Unless we do this, we must go for help uh, to various psychological groups, some of which, unfortunately, can do very little in long-range planning for the individual. We may be able to get him over an immediate crisis but he will fall into another almost immediately because he has no remedy against crisis in himself. And it is this basic remedy that we most deeply require. Now in this emergency, we are beginning to look everywhere. We are looking in many places where 50 years ago we would not have turned a glance. And we are reminded also uh, that both Spangler and Toynbee, two of our great historical philosophers, have come to the conclusion that we are moving into a curious philosophic era, an era in which necessity is bringing or forcing a philosophy upon us. And while neither of these men wished to 
come right out and say what this philosophy would be, because for both of them the historical factor was difficult. We can't pick a philosophy of long ago and simply drop it on ourselves here. We have to take philosophic principles and reapply them but preserve the values. And both of these men were of the opinion that ultimately Western man would drift more and more into a strongly Asiatic philosophical point of view. The only uh, reason for this probably is that Asia has remained as the only area in which philosophic principles have continued to be alive and where the religious principles which most involve man are not archaic. Our religion must be approached historically. In many of the Asiatic countries, what, has, what occurred 2,000 years ago in the West is occurring today. Therefore, there is a contemporary possibility of analysis and consideration. Now, it is not by any means obvious uh, that the Eastern nations have solved their problems or have completely uh, brought their own worlds into pattern. But we are dealing now not with collective, not with the imposing of one political theory upon another. We are not dealing with the price of rice or the scarcity of water. We are dealing essentially with the problem of the individual who has to get up tomorrow morning and face life. Now he has got to face life with the best possible equipment. And uh, we know that the only type of equipment today that will help him is that by which he is equipped to examine himself, uh, to go into his own nature and find out why he is what he is. The moment we say, go in and look, we come sharply against the boundary of Western culture. Western culture has been a gay extroversion for a long time. It has been very gay, but nobody seems to be very happy about it. Western culture has been to move out into the world around us and try to shape it to our heart's desire. Western culture has been done very little in the actual examination into the inner life of the human being. Most of what has been done has been comparatively uh, materialistic effort to crash through from the outside in terms of psychology and psychiatry. But actually, we have less than 50 years probably in the West of any systematic effort to really do anything with man's inner life. And what we have accomplished is not adequate. On the other hand, we have a philosophy on the other side of the world in which the inner life has been so important that many outer things have been miserably neglected. So we come into the presence of extremes. But at the moment we need something, and we need something very definitely. We do not need the mistakes of other people, but we do need whatever they have accomplished that might be a guide to our own action. We do need something at the moment to balance an extensive and over-intensive materialism. And materialism does not necessarily mean uh, just the scientific or industrial or economic worlds. Materialism has crept also very heavily into Western religion and has heavily indoctrinated Western philosophy. Consequently, we are in trouble. And in our search for some answer, we have to look to the only place where we think uh, we can find some rudiments to build a wit. We do not intend necessarily to follow the way of another people, because actually we are a Western culture. But what we need is some way in which we can get hold of what might be termed our natural culture pattern, bring it out and use it. And the only way we know is by uh, calling upon people who have brought internals out and done something about it. And uh, that does bring us more or less toward the Asiatic point of view. Because here at least we have somebody who tried. And for a long time we have not been adequately trying. 
Now, the uh, adaptation cannot be entire or, to, or complete, and I don't think there's any need to consider uh, the entire transference as religious. I don't think we should regard the development of man as a theological problem. That's been one of our mistakes. We have thought that the individual who was good uh, had certain religious benefits from being good. I think that more important than that, that the individual who is good in the sense of proper virtuous understanding is simply right. And because he is right, he is cooperating with the universe, with life, with nature, and his fellow man. But these things are not great religious virtues. They are nothing more or less than human decency. But we haven't gotten around to such a factual look at it. So it isn't necessary for us to think that we are going to follow some foreign creed. What we are looking for is the instrumentation of personal culture. We are looking for the implementing of our own conviction of need so that we are able to do something about it. Self-expression certainly is indicated. And self-expression has helped many people all over the world. And self-expression can move into the life of the individual without causing any panic, without causing him to lose face with his neighbor, or without requiring some stupendous expenditure which he cannot afford. Self-expression is perfectly possible to the individual in any bracket of income. It is a problem of moving the internal part of life and getting it mo moving out into action so that the person is moved by the principles within himself. Now, a lot of people who uh, try this, however, get into another dilemma. They are unable to estimate what is moving or why they are being pressured in a certain way. It is not enough to say that if we simply follow internal inclination as we know it, that we're going to get anywhere. Because too many people today have a powerful internal inclination to be unpleasant. Also, most people have a very overwhelming inclination to be selfish. This, therefore, is not the answer, that we merely do what we feel like doing. We'll never get anywhere that way. We have to go behind this. So we do learn immediately from Eastern philosophies that there are two sources of inner pressure. The most common and available source is just plain selfishness. The deeper and more important source is the universal law complex within ourselves, in which there is at the source and root of ourselves an archetypal pattern through the acceptance and application of which we are true to the plan for ourselves. So we have to try to figure out how to get at the real one. How to substitute universal purpose for self-purpose. How we can achieve obedience to the universe rather than obedience to our own selfishness. To accomplish this, there has to be a certain amount of effort. But if there is no effort, naturally, all reward is less. That which is most difficult or most rare is most highly valued. And what we are searching for is the most valuable thing in the world, peace of spirit. Therefore, we cannot buy it cheaply, and it will not be discounted after the first of the year. We have to work with it. The thoughtful person can work with it by using a simple code of personal attitude. We can use the mind as it was intended to be used, namely as a sensor of conduct. The purpose of the mind is not to take part in the conspiracy of selfishness. The purpose of the mind is to reveal to us the constructive results of constructive action and the destructive results of destructive action. 
the mind makes available to us the facts about the consequences of what we do. If then we are really inclined to be in search of self-creativity, we must begin to use the mind to reveal to us what is wrong with ourselves. Up to now we've always used it to find out what was right about ourselves and what was wrong about everyone else. Also in emergencies we use the mind as an escape mechanism. We try to talk ourselves in and out of things. We use the mind to develop uh, explanations that explain nothing. We also use it in the mind for uh, various self-justifications, for things that cannot factually be justified. So the mind is available to us as a simple instrument for, by which we can think through our own conduct. We can very quietly decide whether what we are doing is right or wrong. This comes first because we have to clear the way. The road that leads in to the sanctuary in our own hearts has been so neglected that it is practically impassable. You can't bring people in this road. You can't travel it yourself because it has been so long neglected that it is worse than any provincial road in some aboriginal community. In fact, it's one of those problems like you find in Africa sometimes where it is much easier to travel if you stay off the road. This is the problem we have. The road is in very bad shape. To get this road back into condition, we have to begin to repair it. And one of the ways that we must use to repair it is to make sure uh, that we know when and how to demand and require and to what degree uh, we are able uh, to get rid of the false situations which are blind alleys on roads that lead nowhere. Many people have sincerely, earnestly, and honorably followed a road that led nowhere simply because they had no discrimination. They did not use the mind to help them. We have allowed the mind to hinder us for thousands of years, but it is here because it could help us. And one of the ways in which it can help us is to censor our attitude and conduct. So we begin with the only way that we know how to begin. We all have moral sense. We all have certain inner conviction. We have all, to some degree, a traditional religious background. We know about the Sermon on the Mount and we know of the revelation of the Ten Commandments. We know the essential codes of right that have been exercised and promulgated by man from the beginning of known time. We also recognize as a fact that those who have kept these rules have become the most gracious, constructive, and valuable of citizens. Consequently, we're not completely without some help. The problem is to bridge between this help and our own nature. So we start out in the morning uh, quite convinced that we are self-motivating creatures, but in the ma majority of cases the motivation arises in the liver or in the suprarenal cortex there doesn't seem to be very much true motivation. So today we are hardly able to crawl along under this motivation. We are tired before we start and exhausted before we finish. But we do start out and we almost immediately begin to sense that our conduct is inconsistent with value. It is not getting us there. We know that when we become a little impatient early in the morning, it isn't good, but we can't help it. As we go a little further through the day, the impatience increases. Uh, somebody does something or says something that isn't pleasant, we're either angry or offended. If we are angry, we say something unpleasant ourselves and consider that that is a solution. We are trying to fight one poison with another. Or if we're hurt, we mood and brood over it and finally collapse in a state of self-pity. 
we do this. Then we go out and we uh, start to do some things we regard as important. Our mind isn't really on the things we're doing. We take ten steps where one would be sufficient. We haven't organized. We meet each new issue of the day with a large measure of aggressiveness or belligerence. Nothing is moving smoothly. Nothing is done simply in a natural way because it is something to be done. Everything is heavy with overtones and undertones of a negative nature. We won't go along more than an hour in the morning before the mind will report this to us. That begins to present a problem. The only answer seems to be to turn to the mind as we would to a small child and say, Shish, we don't want to hear the news. So we turn on the television and get worse news. We do not want to hear the mind tell us that we're stupid. After it has told us a few million times, we think it's a nagger. And finally, the mind in general despair gives up. It also becomes educated badly by our own attitudes and becomes so toxic with our own self-pity and selfishness that it can no longer function. But most thoughtful people still have some function there. So when these reports come in, what is the other thing to do? The other thing to do is to say that here is where education begins. Education is not a matter of schooling, it's a matter of listening. It's a matter of listening to the need of self. So after we have had one of these tempests in the teapot, which makes up the life of most people, we can pause and say, just what is all this about? Uh, why is this so necessary. Why is it that when we feel like doing a certain thing or thinking a certain thought, there is absolutely nothing we can do about it except do what we feel like doing? What would we do if we tried to bring up children the way we bring up our own thoughts and feelings? We would have a group of delinquents. Therefore, we have a group of delinquent thoughts and feelings. But what we don't realize is that there is never one moment in life when these thoughts and feelings, bad or impossible as they may be, are actually self-motivated. They have no life but the life we give them. They have no power except the power that we hand to them. If we get a mind or an emotional nature that starts and rants and raves until it finally takes over our lives, we are suffering from an internal case of dictatorship, and some emotion or some attitude has become our private Castro, and has gradually put us into a hopeless situation of negation. Every time we get mad and tear something or throw something, we are just suffering from a problem of an internal Mr. Khrushchev. The moment he doesn't get what he wants, he throws things. We do the same thing, perhaps not quite so aggressively. But we are under the dictatorship of notions and opinions that have no right to rule anything. As long as those are left uncontrolled and undirected, we are under a tyranny, and the interior self-creative consciousness cannot operate. But we are never in this condition because we have to be. The only answer is we're in it because we want to be. We're in it because there's a certain emotional satisfaction in doing what we feel like doing, even though it may ultimately lead us to the electric chair or the gallows. If we have this feeling, we have to do it. Now here's where our Oriental philosophy comes into this a little bit. Our Oriental philosophy says that any moment, in the middle of any tantrum, any temper fit, or at that time when we are most sorry for ourselves, or when we are most suspicious and critical of other people, we can stop it instantly if we want to. The question is, do we want to? We can stop it in several ways. We can't stop it by fighting it. We can't stop it by using a tremendous exertion of the will any more than we can actually control any person by force. We can get only at best a kind of eye service. 
We cannot get, make another person good by force, and we cannot make ourselves good by force. Therefore, the problem is that wherever a situation is out of hand, we are energizing the wrong value. Just take the energy away from it. Instead of kicking the machine, turn off the plug at the wall. That's the end of that program. I've heard people sit in front of television and complain for hours, shouting, groaning, and howling because the program was terrible. But not one of them thought to get up and turn it off. <laughs> because when you're in a problem and to suffer, there's a certain satisfaction in suffering vastly and continuously. When we feel that we have a cause of complaint, the more complaining we can do, the better we feel about it. And we have wasted the life that we should be using to grow with. So wherever in our own inner life problems arise, there is no need or no real solution in trying to kick them around. The answer lies in turning off the energy. Because all of these things exist only because our own vitality sustains them. The moment we refuse to sustain them, they evaporate. They cannot survive without the energy, energy that we give them by mental and emotional acceptance. Now, how do we turn off energy? Actually, it is a simple direct motion, and man today has very little experience in simple direct anything. Everything must be complicated. One of the simplest ways uh, to prevent a situation from continuing to go out of hand is simply to place in the spot where it was something else. If instead of continuing to energize something we don't believe in, we turn and start to do something we do believe in, we immediately reduce the energy allotment to the negative thing. The moment we do something that is constructive, we use the energy which we are now allowing to tyrannize ourselves. So self-purpose of a constructive nature does take this energy. And one way in which self-purpose becomes available to us is through creativity. Self-purpose means that the contented individual is using his energy for some constructive purpose. Now this constructive purpose may not be vast or uh, particularly tangible to other people. The old farmer sitting with his uh, chair backed up against the porch, quietly whittling a stick, was doing something that he wanted to do. Now, it wasn't very important, but it was much more important than criticism, much more important than self-pity. Perhaps he was making a new handle for some implement on the farm, making it as they had to make it. Today we buy the handle and save the time and worry with it. <laughs> so all we do is buy ourselves more time for the creation of negative attitudes that we don't want. But wherever a negative thing comes along, there is the possibility of the substitution, quiet substitution of a constructive activity. We have to be aware of it, however. We have to be sufficiently desirous in order that we make this substitution. We also have to be uh, observing, as we would be with a child. We have to know that when the time is right to make suggestions to self, and we have to make the suggestion clearly and follow it up. It cannot be a generality that sometime we'll do better. It has to be an immediate, concrete thing at the time when the need arises. In a very short time, this autocorrectivism, which we set up as a conscious process rather than as a subconscious one, also gains habitual authority. We can have good habits just as we can have bad ones. And if we will discipline ourselves for six months, against our own negations, we will at the end of that time have an automatic self-discipline which will carry us through most of the minor emergencies and will only cause us to be 
uh, consciously watchful in some major situation. We can also dis discover and observe the causes of these things. We can gradually try to correct causes. If certain situations that are unpleasant to us are constantly revived by a certain condition, we can we'll go to work also on the condition itself, trying to put it in order so that it will no longer cause trouble. But merely to correct condition, as far as I've been able to observe, has never corrected the tendency uh, to negative habits. The moment one cause is removed, the mind turns and grasps on something else and makes a new cause. So it cannot be merely the removal of the problem. It is not only th that, but it is also the redirecting of our own energy. Now, if we don't fight with it, if we don't say this thought I shouldn't have, I'm just not going to allow myself this thought. We get all over this type of defense mechanism and simply turn to something constructive and interesting and take over. This negative thought simply dies of warning. There's nothing to sustain it. Now the person needs, therefore, something of a constructive nature, uh, something active on which he can uh, turn his attention at these critical moments. And there, of course, is where your self-creativity again comes in. It has to be something that calls upon energy. Our worrying is causing us to call upon energy. It is causing negative energy. We must, therefore, have a positive call upon energy, a, a positive plan or purpose, which we can call upon almost immediately when a negative situation arises. If we get a little tired or a little worried or a little nervous, we can go over down and sit down quietly at the piano and play for 15 minutes. The chances are our mood will change. We're not saying we won't worry. We're simply saying we will play the piano. But we are using energy. And the energy that we're using for that purpose is no longer available to nurse some grievance. We can be busy and miserable, but we cannot have creative... Uh, instinct without this moving in upon our common patterns and causing something valuable to happen. It is to evade a possible, of course, uh, the complete monotony by means of which we do not gain this mental relief. We can do certain things with our hands and still worry, but we cannot have great creative ideas and still worry. So there are things that every person can attempt to do. And the Orient has shown us what some of these things are. One thing, of course, if it is possible, is the garden, where we can build a little world, a world of beauty that challenges us and which causes us perhaps to read about it, study it, maybe take lessons, and finally to apply what we have learned to the ordering of our own life. If our situations do not permit gardens, there are worlds in a flat dish on a table. This is your bonsai tree theory of the ancients, the sand garden, the rock garden, the garden that is only 12 inches square and which is yet a continual challenge to our own instinct to the beautiful. It's not easy to work with living things and at the same time hate people. It is not easy to have beauty a power in your life and then think unbeautifully. You can do it by theory, but if your hands are working with beauty, if you are continually trying to do things creatively, if you are trying to take a pattern and make it better, it calls upon energy. And this energy gives you a forward-looking emotional experience. There, are, there must be in every person's life some creative self-expression. If there is nothing that we can do, then it is certainly indicated that even at the expense of some time, we should study something, not that leads only to intellectual satisfaction, but leads to action. There must be something that gets the hands occupied in creating a thing which calls upon our own inner resource. You can study books for a lifetime, for example, in trying to prepare a miniature garden. I'm now thinking of one of the little table gardens. 
you can read all the books and take all the courses. And then you bring in a handful of little twigs and stones and some sand and a rock or two and perhaps a little porcelain figure and some blossoms. And you will never find in any book just what you have to do with these things you have brought in and laid on the table alongside of you. You can copy as best you can, but your little twigs are not the same shape. You have to do something yourself. You have to satisfy your own taste. You put these things together, you think they're marvelous, you take the, a little separate look about five feet and you say, how could I have ever done anything as badly as that? And you rush back and try and do it again. You may wear out two or three bones and half the rocks before you get anything that you can honestly say satisfies your own soul. But when you do, something has happened. You have had a small mystical experience. The beauty in you, the truth in you, has had a chance to come out and do something. And in the process of this alchemy, all of the particular problems of the moment have disappeared for a little while at least. And if we took all the time we negatively waste in worry, fear, doubt, self-pity um, and things of that nature, and put this time into a lump somewhere, it would provide us with the opportunity, time-wise, of becoming masters of almost anything. But you are now trying to make something happen. You are trying to create. You may be trying to create a beautiful poem. You may be trying to create a marvelous picture. You may be trying to create a design on a loom. You are trying to create a new pattern. Wherever you are creating, you are releasing. And the thing you have created becomes the judge of your own release. You look at it, and it isn't what you thought it was going to be. It is not nearly as beautiful as your idea. So you keep on working with it. You keep on releasing beauty until finally you produce something which may not be perfect, but you will say, this I can endure. This indicates I've accomplished something. So life becomes a release of creativity. You will find, of course, that once the door is open, along this gateway or roadway of creativity comes a, quite a troop of, this, of different values. This open door to creativity also becomes more and more a way to the inner life of yourself. You have opened the road. You have repaired it. Perhaps the thing that comes across at first is merely a sense of order or proportion or value or color. But gradually, through this road that you have built, the whole inner life will move into manifestation because you have made the expression of your own consciousness important to you. And it is this expression of self-consciousness that must be understood. Now you can see that the production of something protects us against the wrong level of consciousness coming through. You cannot create a beautiful picture or a beautiful plant by calling upon your own negative opinionism. You cannot say, in looking at some charming thing that you have produced, you cannot say, my selfishness did this. You cannot say that this beautiful flower arrangement exists because you don't like someone, or that you're critical of people, or that you are uh, sorry for yourself. This, uh, this arrangement came as a result of something much deeper than that. And if it did, by any chance, become over-influenced by some negative phase of your personality, the design will be wrong, and your own eyes will tell you that it is wrong, and your own nature will reject it because it is wrong, and you will quietly create your own censorship. And you will learn the same in many fields of creative expression. And once this creativity is moved away from selfishness into the pure expression of its own nature, you will find it available in religion. You will find it available in moral thinking. You will find it assisting you in your physical responsibilities, helping you to recognize the problems of the time and how to face them. 
But you have to get the road open. And the only way we know of releasing the internal is releasing it into action. We cannot release it merely into thought. Because the fact that it moves into action causes it to do things. The moment it does something, we know whether it is true or not. If it never comes into action, what we thought was a beautiful idea might only be a concealed form of our own selfishness. But when it moves into action, it either produces good action or not good action. Instantly we know whether the force itself is good or not good. This is why it has to move into activity. And throughout all of our ways of life, self-creative activity has been important. It is still important in the cottage industries of India. It is still important in folk art, upon which all fine art developed. It is important in the dance and the rhythm of primitive people. They are expressing. And here we sit back in a rather sophisticated way and let machines do all our thinking for us. And because they're not very good at it, we live on the level of a mechanistic inspiration, which is not sufficient. But we can fight through these things and create laws unto ourselves, whereby we can daily observe the degree of our own creative expression. And because we try everything, we weigh all things and cling to that which is good. And for man, the weighing is the using. And by using, we discover whether we were right or not. We give some advice to somebody. He follows it, and he's worse off than he was before. But we've moved away from the picture, and we don't feel any responsibility. We justify ourselves on the grounds that he probably didn't follow the advice correctly, or he should have worked, and we don't even stop giving the same advice to someone else. But if we give this advice to ourselves and it hurts, we're going to stop. We're going to find some other answer. So on our own skin, we have to test all things. And that which produces for us a newer, better, richer way of life, richer in real value, that is the way that we will ultimately cultivate. And our creativity gives us the power to break through this superficial personality and release architectural, archetypal force. And if we do release it in an archetypal experience of creative uh, expression, we have the great design. We have the wonderful fabrics of India and Persia. We have the wonderful ceramics of China and Korea. We have the glorious lacquers and carved ivories of Japan. We have these things because in those days the simplest problem was one of creative expression. If we ever want to solve our problem, we've got to get this personal creative expression back into ourselves so that everything we do is meaningful. And even when we buy, we buy meaning, not just objects. We have become more careful, more thoughtful, more discriminating. And out of this comes a better life for all of us. Time is up. Time is up.